tonight on CBC Vancouver News. BC tourism recovery setback. If we don't have a, a business from China, that is a problem uh, to us. China snubs Canada, leaving it off its approved list of travel destinations. And attention for all the wrong reasons. This is a 200, yeah, 200 square foot apartment in downtown Eastside. This is your living room. Why a TikTok ad for a Vancouver SRO is raising eyebrows and concern from the city. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Leanne Young. Thanks for joining us. More than 100 hikers and tourists are breathing a sigh of relief tonight after being rescued from an aggressive wildfire in BC's southern interior. The group was cut off when the only road out of the lodge they were staying in near Carameas was engulfed by flames. Officials say two large fires merged and grew overnight. And as Brady Strachan reports, now some say some of that damage could have been prevented. This dramatic footage was shot earlier this afternoon from one of the hikers rescued from Cathedral Provincial Park. The fire has burned trees, shrubs and cattle fencing along several kilometres of the only road leading into the remote mountain park near Karameas. And it cut off hikers, campers and guests staying at a tourist lodge in the park. So there was definitely, you know, some nerves, I think, for everyone and, and a little bit of anxiety. She and dozens of others were ordered to shelter in place late last night as the fire raged not far away. But today, officials escorted her and 70 others out through the fire zone to safety. You know, it doesn't look anything like it used to. I spent much of my childhood going up there to those campsites, and now a lot of it is completely gone on both sides of the road. Tuesday afternoon, as temperatures rose into the high 30s, two fires, which have been burning for weeks near Karameas, exploded in size. A massive plume of smoke was visible from all over the Okanagan, including from Kelowna, more than 100 kilometers away, where this time-lapse video was taken. Fire officials say the two fires have now merged into one, growing by 10 times their size over the day, and now cover an estimated 100 square kilometers. And today, frustration that these fires weren't prioritized weeks ago. We're seeing a lot of similarities to the 2018 Snowy Mountain fire, where the, the decision to leave it and let it burn and then we run into a situation where we're doing evacuation orders and well state of emergency evacuation order alerts all within an hour it it drives me it, i'm very frustrated with this process about the decision to let things just go on their own but with the extreme conditions this summer and the record year for fires in the province officials say crews can't be everywhere all at once Today we have a positive outcome where people from uh, the park, the lodge and along Ashnola Road are now out safe. Fire officials say more hot weather and expected wind in the forecast is a concern for this fire and the many dozens of others that are burning across the province. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. That Crater Creek wildfire there near Karameas is just one of 363 fires burning across the province tonight. There are nine new fires in the past 24 hours that are considered out of control. 51 communities are under evacuation alert, and nine communities remain under evacuation order. The BC Wildfire Service is bracing for conditions to worsen with an incoming cold front. The Wildfire Service is very concerned about the upcoming ridge breakdown and what that could mean in terms of fire behaviour. We would like to alert the public that there could be rapidly evolving uh, fire behaviour. Um, and fire behavior that could spread very quickly across the landscape. And so paying attention to any updates and alerts that are for your area is, is very critical in the upcoming days. Some of the images captured we have as seen close to record temperatures across the province this week, including in the town of Lytton, which hit 42.2 degrees yesterday. And with rising fire activity comes more smoke and ash, bringing air quality down in many parts of the province. And Darius Madavi joins me now with a first look at that weather. So Darius, all eyes on this cold front, I'm sure. What, what are you seeing? 
it's still going to be quite some time before we see those temperatures come down. Uh, on the coast, Vancouver and Victoria, we could see them come down into tomorrow evening. Uh, and then for the big drop comes on Friday. But uh, just like you said, air quality is a big concern right now. And it's one of the things that often gets overlooked when we talk about these high pressure systems that lock down all this heat in the southern part of the province. But it's not just heat. We have these heat warnings in place, but they often hide where you can see this little gray outline is showing where we also have air quality statements. So uh, just like the heat gets locked in by these high pressure systems, so does the smoke. And so the air quality is a real concern. You can take a look at this footage from Cam, uh, just outside Kamloops by Shuswap Lake uh, that is really showing how severe these situations can be. Right now, the air quality in Kamloops, which has the nearest monitoring station to uh, where this footage was taken, is at a seven, which is uh, out of 10, very high, uh, air quality concern but tonight and into tomorrow the air quality will go up to a 10 plus meaning uh, it's a very high air quality danger uh, it's the highest that the rating scale goes now we have the air quality wor uh, worries we also have the heat today we saw temperatures once again in the mid to high 30s we saw some temperature records that might break but because of all the smoke trapped in these areas we didn't get the sun to break those records so the smoke sort of exchanged itself for the heat. So definitely smoky in parts of the Kootenays, but not breaking those temperature records today. Right, a slight silver lining, but those pictures, my, very, very stark to see just how orange the skies are. Okay. All right, thanks for that, Darius. Thank you. With all of this heat, are you struggling to get some proper sleep at night? You're not alone. It can be challenging to get a good night's rest, especially when temperatures don't cool very much overnight. Our Michelle Gossoub has been looking into the science behind those hot summer nights and has tips on how to cool down the bedroom. On the hot streets of Vancouver, everyone has their own advice for how to cool down before bed. Definitely just sleep with just your sheets. You don't need your whole blanket. And have a fan on in the room, even if you don't have AC. I think that makes a big difference. And what about what you wear to bed? Pretty much nothing. A sheet. A sheet. I've got to have a sheet. A fan and air conditioning. Yeah, essential. Otherwise, you're going to... Bust. According to Statistics Canada, only 32% of homes in BC have air conditioning. And while the ideal room temperature to sleep maxes out at 28 degrees Celsius, many people are trying to sleep in homes that are 32 degrees or higher. The optimal humidity for us to sleep in is 40 to 60%. And I went online and looked today, and in Vancouver, it's 65% right now. So that makes it feel even hotter than the ambient temperature is telling us it is. So what happens there is we don't start to fall asleep until our core temperature starts to drop. And then about six hours after we fall asleep, our core temperature starts to go up. And that's our signal that it's time to wake up for the day. So you can imagine how hard it is when you're sleeping in a really hot room and your core temperature's not really dropping and it's staying high. So that signal that your body normally has about when to wake up gets messed up, excuse the expression, by having such a hot sleep environment. Hall recommends putting a bowl of ice between you and your fan, sleeping in breathable cotton or linen sheets, sucking on ice cubes before bed, and finally, avoid alcohol. That can cause night sweats. And if you do share a bed with someone, keeping your distance may be best to avoid overheating. You could try sleeping bottom to top, so you've got a little bit more room, rather than both trying to sleep, you know, with your heads at the same place. And sleeping like a starfish is supposed to help. So really spreading out so that there's more sweat happening and evaporating. Cool marine air rolling in tonight is expected to bring some reprieve on the coast. But with humidity still high, embracing your inner starfish tonight could bring some much-needed shut-eye. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. China has left Canada off a list of approved travel destinations for tour groups. The move comes as the tourism industry is trying to recover to pre-pandemic numbers. As John Hernandez reports, BC is poised to be among the hardest hit by the policy. Travel agent Glynis Chan has been trying to get back on her feet ever since the pandemic. She lost her office as business dried up. She'd often work with group tour operators in China. We put everything for them on behalf, so that's how we make our business, and then that will be uh, good revenue to us. 
business that won't be coming back anytime soon. Last week, China lifted a pandemic ban on group tours in dozens of countries, including the United States, but Canada was left out. Uh, I feel kind of a little bit frustrated because uh, we don't see the green light to help us to pick up our regular business as, uh, you know, 2019 or before. The move comes amid strained diplomatic ties between the countries, but is expected to leave a particularly gaping hole in BC's tourism economy. In 2019, Chinese travelers made well over 300,000 visits to the province and spent a lot of money. Each traveler spent over $2,000 on average. It's very concerning. China was a very important market for us prior to the pandemic and we expect it to be a growing and important market for us in future. And having this designation by China means a delay in that process. Chinese citizens can still travel independently here, but the number of flights to Vancouver from China have plummeted since the pandemic. Destination BC hopes that could change if Canada gets back on China's list. Once we have that, uh, then we're expecting um, the flight capacity to increase. Uh, you know, directly from mainland China. Still, Destination BC says the tourism economy has rebounded substantially since 2020, with travelers from other provinces, the U.S. and Mexico, picking up a lot of the slack. A lot of the attractions and hotels and uh, local suppliers are doing quite well this year from a lot of those other markets. A tourism economy that's back on the rise, but still missing its biggest spenders. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. It's been two years since the Taliban took control in Afghanistan. The Canadian government and military have pulled out, but an untold number of Afghans who assisted Canadians when we were there are still waiting to flee to this country under federal programs. Rafi Bujakanyan profiles one man who escaped to B.C. but is struggling to bring his family here with him. My wife, my sister is here with me, my brother. Pictures and video are all Assad Ali Afghan can show his daughter of their loved ones. He's a former interpreter for the Canadian military. He arrived in Canada last year after fleeing Afghanistan. His two brothers and sister and their kids are hoping to do the same. Like a person divided in two places, you know, it's always hard. Afghans' relatives fled for neighboring Pakistan after Kabul fell to the Taliban, but two years later, the Canadian government has yet to open up their case files. His brother says the Taliban targets those who helped the West and their relatives. He asked us to hide his identity because he still doesn't feel safe. He barely steps out, concerned about threats from local law enforcement. It's always dangerous there to, you know, stay for longer. Assad Ali Afghan is still fighting to bring his family here. He says he's provided Immigration Canada documents showing he's financially responsible for his siblings and hasn't seen any movement. What we've seen from the government is slow inaction on making sure that the most vulnerable can get to safety. Opposition parties and refugee advocates have urged Ottawa to move faster to bring Afghans here. The government says it's doing what it can and may even expand their program to include more people. There is some uncertainty in, in the number of people obviously that assisted Canada and clearly what their family members, who their family members are and the level of risk that those people face in that country. And it's not like uh, Canada will hit a number and walk away from the table. The Immigration Department says it expects some 40,000 Afghans will have landed here by the end of the year. Unclear if that will include Assad Ali Afghan's family. Officials have told him the files are under review. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. A viral video marketing a downtown Vancouver apartment is getting attention for all the wrong reasons. The square footage is low, the rent is high, and the company that owns the building is facing controversy for the way they're renovating the units. Our Justin McElroy has more on the TikTok ad and the outrage. The Lotus Hotel. It's a building on the edge of Vancouver's downtown east side, next to a quirky mall, and home to a very strange marketing pitch. This is the neighborhood. This is a 200, yeah, 200 square foot apartment in downtown east side. This is your living room. This is the price. This was the start of a video by a real estate marketing company posted on TikTok and Instagram yesterday. 
but this was deleted after hundreds of comments pointed out that the tone was just a little off. Now, whether the video was genuine or intended as satire is unclear, as the company declined comment. What we do know is the apartment listing and the price was very real. This is the posting on Craigslist. This is the posting on the property management company's website. And who used to live in these units before they were renovated, you might ask? Often, people who didn't have anywhere else to go. For you see, the Lotus is an SRO. Many of the units have tenants renting for under $1,000 a month. And the Toronto-based company that owns the building have been offering people living in unrenovated units $15,000 to leave. So, and we talk with a lot of people from the buildings, they're like, yeah, no, that happens all the time, so to pay attention to them, like, okay. And that's what we did. And we're still living here, like, chill, kind of. Juanita and her boyfriend are two of the many residents who have received those letters. They are students, moving out in two months, on their own volition. Others likely have less options, though. It's a situation that the city is alarmed about, but because the Supreme Court struck down their attempt to install vacancy controls, they have few options. For the time being, our hands are, are pretty much tied because the, the SRO housing bylaws that we have in place really only protect the typology of these sort of single-room occupant units. They don't protect the, 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 the price point. And all of this in a context of a rental situation that, even by Vancouver standards, is getting more and more difficult for those most in need. This is a chart. The average asking price for one bedroom in this city is now above $3,000, making a $2,000 unit, no matter how small, a comparative steal. Meanwhile, hours after the marketer deleted her video, the property management company deleted their Craigslist posting for the apartment. They didn't respond to a request for comment as to why it was removed. Neither did the Toronto-based owners of the property, making this story almost as much of a mystery as how anyone making under six figures affords this city. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. A counselor with the Coquitlam First Nation has been found dead, and a man is under arrest. This is a quickly evolving um, situation. We wanted to get this information out to you because I know there's been a lot of speculation about Miss Patterson's well-being. There's a lot of people out there. Uh, obviously, we're very concerned for her safety, and uh, tragically, this is where we've resulted. Stephanie Patterson's body was discovered yesterday in a rural area west of Mission by locals in the area. She was reported missing last Friday. The man in custody has not yet been charged. Meanwhile, homicide investigators also gave an update on the Surrey Temple shooting of a Sikh leader in June. We believe that the driver of the Camry was waiting on 121 Street in the Camry, waiting for the two suspects before and during the homicide. Investigators have now confirmed there was a third suspect involved in the murder. Police believe that third suspect drove two others away from the scene in the vehicle. Investigators have released surveillance photos of the vehicle, as you can see there, along with a blurry image of the new suspect. Investigators are asking anyone who recognizes them to contact police. The woman who impersonated a nurse in B.C. and across North America is facing yet another round of criminal charges. This time, Bridget Claroux is facing allegations from her time at a private surgery clinic in Victoria in 2020. She's being charged with fraud, impersonation, assault, and using forged documents during her brief employment at View Royal. She worked at the private clinic for three weeks before Island Health took over the facility. Claroux has amassed dozens of charges while employed in B.C., Alberta, Colorado, and Ontario, where she's currently serving a seven-year prison sentence. And a second life for Quest University in Squamish. It's set to reopen as a new campus of Capilano University come 2024. With some funding help from the B.C. government, CapU bought the campus for $63.2 million. The beleaguered Quest University struggled for years, finally closing up permanently in April of this past year. CapU's new Squamish campus will serve approximately 100 students when it opens in spring of 2024. It's expected to serve more than 380 students in later years. After a couple days of delays, it was all aboard on Hello Ferries today as the new ferry company took passengers to the seas for the first time. Again, building, building up that trust through demonstrating to everyone that we have uh, safety and reliability as, at, uh, at the forefront of our minds. We're never going to do anything that, uh, that jeopardizes that. It was a rough start to the week after numerous cancellations due to both high winds and a power outage. But its co-founder was determined that day one was going to be all about getting it just right.
And it certainly seemed like passengers who traveled between Vancouver and Nanaimo were pleased with the maiden voyages. It was a really smooth ride. The, the engine was really, uh, really quiet. And uh, just we were just cruising. We were flying down the, the Strait of Georgia, and it was, it was a really great experience. I think it's just going to be a lot easier for people to access downtown Vancouver and for job opportunities. Pretty excited, because I work in North Vancouver. I have a business over there, so this is going to make commuting a lot easier. Yes, this is way better. I'm really looking forward to it. Rising temperatures, burning force, flooding coasts, seemingly endless climate issues to be worried about. After the break, we'll hear from a mental health expert on how to handle climate anxiety. And thanks for watching our commercial free live stream. A PEI man will be heading to the Invictus Games in Germany. The event features hundreds of veterans and military members from all over the world who are dealing with mental and physical injuries. And as Laura Meter tells us, a big part of the therapy is connected to sport. Kenton Dill knows his family and friends are rooting for him as he gets ready for Invictus Games. This is a regular training day, but in a few weeks he'll be in front of a much bigger crowd in Germany. Uh ups and downs of emotion, uh, nerves, stress, uh, questioning if you're ready, if you're mentally ready, if you're physically ready, F being scared as well as being excited. This is basically everything that he's worked for and I'm just really proud that he's going to be able to show his skills and stuff and represent his country, which is awesome. I'm going to be there cheering him on the whole time, which is I'm very excited for that, very excited to be able to see him succeed. He will compete in rowing, swimming, and seated volleyball. He's one of 31 athletes on the Canadian team. The goal of the Games is to help sick or injured members of the military and veterans. Kenton Dill has physical and mental injuries from the 24 years he spent in the military. I felt so alone, and then once you go to Invictus and you go to the first training camp, it's just an explosion of emotion, and they won't let you go. Like, they, they got you, and, and you finally realize they get it. And making sure that they can find a new passion in life and make sure they get out of some time of that uh, very dark place where they are. Coaches say Dill is a talented athlete and a major player on the Canadian team. He make a real impact on this team with his uh, very disciplined, person, very calm person, is a, is a great leader in that team. He says it's rehabilitation through sport. Kenton Dill says he's always in touch with teammates and trainers, and athletes can also talk to medical staff and therapists. The Canadian team will train together for a few days next month before heading to Germany. Dill hopes to do well, but it's not about getting a medal. He says it's about military people from all over the world supporting one another to lift each other up and to be inspired by other nations and, and their stories. And them doing the same for, for us is, is something that's going to be spectacular. The Invictus Games takes place in Dusseldorf, Germany, September 9th to the 16th. Laura Meter, CBC News, Summerside. From heat records to wildfire threats, if you're feeling worried about the state of our climate, you are not alone. Climate anxiety is a reality facing many in our province. And earlier today, I spoke to an expert about it. She says her research has shown that young people are among the most affected. In one study that we did of 10,000 16 to 25 year olds around the world, we were looking across low and middle and high income nations. My colleagues and I found that 
45% of young people globally say that their daily functioning is being impaired by their climate thoughts and feelings. So that means getting in the way of eating, sleeping, concentrating, playing, having fun, that sort of a thing. 75% of youth globally say that the future is frightening to them. 56% said they feel humanity is doomed. 39% expressed hesitancy to have their own children one day because of the climate crisis. And also these thoughts and feelings were significantly associated with a sense of being betrayed by governments and lied to by leaders on this issue about um, how much action is being taken. People of any age are um, voicing climate distress. It really just depends on if you have a sense of environmental identity, you know, you feel connected to the more than human world, to nature, to biospheres that we depend on. And if you understand that your own health is tied up with the health of the environment, and then you look outside and you read the news, and you encounter climate disasters, well, then you understand that there's a real global threat at play. This is an appropriate and reasonable response to be distressed about what's happening to our life support systems, right? And so it, it is in that way, a sign of health to feel any climate distress at all. It's a wakefulness to reality. It's a connection to, and compassion for all that's in harm's way. But as mentioned, we want to make sure that it doesn't reach levels that do become functionally impairing, which is when we tend to think about something being a disorder. Action is something that we earn, right? It's something we roll up our sleeves, we come together with others, we strategize, and then we push and we fight. <laughs> and we come into um, the moral space of doing the right thing together and protecting what is shared and what is loved in our society in the future and standing in solidarity with future generations and young people. And hope it cannot be this um, wishful thinking. I find a lot of people at end, the end of the interview, they, they want to know what, what gives you hope, but they're often looking for um, something that will allow them to kind of go back to sleep and feel okay, like some kind of promise that um, some technology is going to come or the right leader will get us all on board. And really, we have to all create this together. But that's what social justice movements have always shown, that in people power, in banding together, in um, creating intersectional movements of solidarity, that's where the hope is earned. So as long as we understand that it's something to be optimistic about when rooted in action, I think that there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of things that we can do to prevent this from getting a whole lot worse. A capital on edge as fires creep closer to Yellowknife. Residents in the Northwest Territories prepare to go. That's next. August 31st, 1957. Elvis Presley plays Vancouver's Empire Stadium. It's the city's first big rock concert. The local responsible for bringing Presley here is disc jockey Red Robinson, who introduced him that night. It was unbelievable. I, uh, people, it's like the day that John F. Kennedy was shot. People can always, always remember where they were. But I've heard over the years so many stories, like I was there and I remember you on the stage and I remember Elvis. and. Uh, it's, it's like a focal point for all of their lives. The anticipation of Presley coming, I mean, what can I say about it? It was phenomenal. It's a one for the money, two for the show. You get ready now, go, can't go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoe. The concert was a sellout, 25,000 fans. With the king on stage, it was a recipe for hysteria. Five minutes after Elvis appeared, the crowd in the bleachers rushed the field. Soon, a huge mob stormed the stage. To escape it, Elvis and his band ran off. A scheduled one-hour concert was cut after 22 minutes. The Empire Stadium concert got big play in the Vancouver media, but not the kind you'd expect today. The Sun headlined its story, Presley fans demented, and listen to these excerpts from the article. Vancouver teenagers were transformed into writhing, frenzied idiots of delight by the savage jungle beat music. Troublemakers turned Presley's one-night stand into the most disgusting exhibition of mass hysteria and lunacy this city has ever witnessed. It was John Kirkwood who wrote that article. Now he's a freelance writer. When Elvis played Vancouver, Kirkwood was a 24-year-old reporter. Today, he says his story was overblown. 
I was going overboard a bit, and I was editorializing, which you're not supposed to do as a reporter. You know, I wasn't uh, a columnist at that time. I was just a reporter, but somehow I got away with it. But I think I was, I was wrong there, I admit it. It wasn't a mass exhibition of lunacy, you know. I was carried away, and obviously the editors were carried away because they went along with it. The negative reaction to Elvis was nothing new. In Vancouver, as elsewhere, rock and roll had a bad reputation. This, this was a tremendous departure from the music world that had existed, all nice and candy-coated. So all of the adults who were writing about it couldn't relate to it. There'd never been anything like this except Frank Sinatra in the 40s, but not uh, of this frenzy, not of the pounding departure from jazz or pop music. Elvis's departure from mainstream music influenced a lot of local musicians. And while his influence may have dwindled with the years, it was important in the early stages of Vancouver's rock scene. I think he was an impetus. The severe wildfire situation in the Northwest Territories remains very fluid. Cameron McIntosh takes us into the race for some to get out of the territory and the hope of others that they won't need to leave. Heeding the warnings and for some, orders to leave. Trips out of the fire zones, harrowing for many. Holy shit. Videos like this showing the dire situation in parts of the Northwest Territories, including photos from one family showing parts of the car they fled in, burned and melted. In the capital Yellowknife, many didn't wait for an order to leave. Bit surprised with the escalation of the forest fires in this region when we landed 12, 13 days ago, wasn't much of a concern. Landing in Edmonton, Ashley McClellan just happy to get her baby out of the smoke. Watching the flights sell out and the prices go up, I just kind of got to a point where it was like, we should leave. It's a situation changing by the hour with at least 230 fires burning across the territory. Yellowknife is now the biggest concern. On the edge of the city, Kyle Thomas is trying to wait it out, watching over his bakery and micro farm, but his bags are packed. There's no set plan, there's nothing we're following that's telling us exactly what to do. We're kind of making this up on as we go. If I could take every single firefighter from the world, I would take them at this point. Premier Caroline Cochran is working with what she has. We're hoping to do fire breaks. We're working on it currently, uh, but it's pretty smoky here today, which means when there's smoke, we don't have the aircraft, uh, the water bombers. However, in other parts of the territory, rain and cooler temperatures are helping around the evacuated communities of Hay River and Fort Smith. Aircraft and helicopters were able to get up in the air last night and this morning to undertake fire suppression efforts, which is such good news. It's really hard when those are grounded. It may be a while before anyone contemplates a return, with plenty of risk for people still trying to drive out. Hundreds of evacuees are ending up in central Alberta, places like Grand Prairie and St. Albert, just outside of Edmonton, where this volunteer firefighter helped conduct the final headcount in Fort Smith. I really didn't feel like leaving. I stayed uh, till last minute that I could as a volunteer firefighter for the town. And that was Cameron McIntosh reporting from Edmonton. To Hawaii now, where officials have begun identifying the victims of last week's wildfire. The number of people killed now stands at 106. But as Lindsay Duncombe tells us, many more are still missing. For the first time since the fire went through Lahaina, the highway is open, allowing traffic to pass through and allowing residents to go back and see what's left of their homes. There's National Guard checking to make sure people actually live in Lahaina before they go in. But from this vantage point, we can see just how 
how vast the damage and how quickly that fire moved. The ground is completely charred. There's a sense of smoke in the air. What's happening in the community behind us is that continued grim search for survivors, but you can just see how destructive that fire was. This vehicle obviously abandoned, totally charred. There is nothing left on the inside. The seats are melted. The metal is broken. The tires completely gone. A scene that is repeated throughout this community, just absolutely devastating damage. And the question now is how difficult will it be for people to rebuild? I've spoken to people who said, you know what, when it comes to vehicles and to apartments, they don't have insurance for that as well. And we are hearing that the move forward as people begin to get inside to these communities is going to be one of a realization of just how difficult rebuilding will be. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, near Lahaina. In Halifax, a new program is hoping to help vulnerable people when natural disasters strike. The volunteer-based program would offer extra help during wildfires or floods. Kayla Hansel explains how it works and why it could save lives. Ray Webb is just back from fishing, but at 75, he knows he's slowing down a little. When post-tropical storm Fiona wreaked havoc on Atlantic Canada last year, he was without power for two weeks. With the trees across the road and the power lines across the road, and uh, we were basically trapped here. Webb lives in rural Pictou County, one of the hardest hit regions. Around here, when disaster strikes, it often falls to the volunteer fire department to check on people. They fall through the cracks because they don't know what resources are available or they don't know how to get in touch with the people. In the Halifax area, a new program is about to launch to change that, a vulnerable persons registry. It can be used in any kind of emergency for anyone who may need extra help. Hurricanes, fires, flash floods, all of which Nova Scotia has seen in a catastrophic way over the past year. And this year's hurricane season is predicted to be above normal. It is the thing that keeps me up at night is worried about how people fall through the cracks. And, you know, we want to be able to help during emergencies to make sure that they're safe. Plans for the program kicked into high gear after an elderly man with Alzheimer's died during Fiona. Now people can register before a disaster. They'll get a text alert and if that doesn't work, an in-person visit. It's modeled after a similar program established in Sault Ste. Marie after a man died during the great North America blackout of 2003. We consider it an additional safeguard to help people, you know, age actively and stay in their homes for longer and be prepared for emergencies. I would do it. I have a VON nurse that comes here and I have recovering from cancer. And uh, so I could use some help maybe. It won't help him right now since he's far outside the city, but there are calls to make the program province-wide. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Blue Mountain, Nova Scotia. Across Canada, governments have dropped most of its COVID-19 restrictions, but what rights do workers have if they still want to wear a mask? Paula Dayan Perez has more on one Montreal woman who was told to ditch her mask and when she said no, lost her job. Sarah Ben Sabat says she's been working in the restaurant industry for 20 years. But last week, her new employer surprised her. They told me that uh, they had gotten some complaints about me masking from customers and that if I wanted to continue working there, I wouldn't be able to wear a mask anymore. Ben Sabat says before quitting, she consulted Quebec's Labour Standards Board. An agent told her the restaurant had the right to decide whether employees can wear masks. As I was just trying to protect myself, you know, sometimes there are like staff that are sick and, you know, they don't wear a mask. I'm doing the right thing and they're telling me I'm not allowed. CBC wasn't able to reach Ben Sabat's former employer. Another person who spoke with CBC says she was fired from a public relations job after refusing to stop wearing a mask. She also called the CNESST and was given a similar explanation. In an email to CBC, the board says while masks are no longer mandatory, they are recommended in some cases. When asked when an employer can ban masks, a spokesperson said each case is different. 
employees who worked a job for at least two years could file a complaint for wrongful dismissal. You're an actor or an actress. This lawyer says very few cases would justify an employer keeping someone from wearing a mask. And complaints from customers don't cut it. There will be some conspirationists, people that are against any kind of measure that will be unhappy about empl employees wearing masks. They're going to be unhappy. That by itself wouldn't be sufficient for an employer to require the employees not to wear a mask because it's a matter of charter of right. Meanwhile, Ben Sabat says finding another job has been hard because after showing up to interviews with a mask, many employers don't call her back. She says one company was very explicit about it. Paula Diem Perez, CBC News, Montreal. A long-time trend at Canadian animal shelters appears to be reversing. For the last decade, shelters were having to take in fewer and fewer cats and dogs. That's according to a study by Humane Canada, the Federation of SPCAs and Humane Societies. But recently, shelters have been getting overwhelmed by new arrivals. As Emily Fitzpatrick reports, operators believe it's a sign of the current economic times. Then we got to 300, then 400, and now we are at 500 animals. So we are absolutely overloaded. Second Chance Animal Rescue volunteers say they've never seen anything like this. Up to 15 calls come in a day about animals in need or families that can no longer care for them. More than doubling their capacity and overflowing to every room. We also have newborn kittens living in the office that staff are taking care of. We actually have a, a puppy recovering from surgery in our bathroom, our bathing room. Puppies in the back room, 10 of them waiting there for their home. So we just, we are no more space. They believe the spike is likely due to the escalating cost of living. The Edmonton Humane Society says they work hard to help families avoid that difficult decision. There might be a one-time medical concern that they're not able to pay for, so we have an emergency uh, veterinary fund that we can refer them to. Um, if they're struggling with food for a while, we can provide pet food, those kinds of things. Uh, we really believe that pets should be with their families, if at all possible. Adoptions have also slowed considerably, resulting in these animals staying longer than ever in shelters. We have some animals uh, almost uh, making it a year in care. So that's never happened before. And now puppies, puppies used to be adopted as soon as they were ready to go. We never had them last year. Now we've got puppies that are four, five, pushing six months old, and a lot of them too. So as I said, that's unprecedented. Getting these animals into homes will take time, and many willing adopters are foster families. But these shelters say increased enforcement and better access to spay and neuter programs could help reverse the trend. Emily Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Edmonton. Rescuers continue to dig through the rubble in India's Himalayas after landslides over the weekend dragged down houses and buildings, killing at least 71 people, leaving hundreds displaced.
Landslides have killed at least 71 people in northern India. As CBC's Salima Shivji reports, a Himalayan town has been hit by three slides just this week, with the deadliest burying a temple. It is that third day of that rescue operation, and it is really slow going for those rescue workers who are on the scene still today. The workers are really having to uh, cut through uprooted trees, get through all of that massive debris that came down with a landslide that really swept away a packed temple in that part of uh, India. It's northern India. It's at the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, they're trying to get to any uh, bodies, but there is really no hope for finding any survivors. So family and uh, friends of those victims are really just waiting and seeing. They, they just want the bodies to be recovered so they can begin the process of, of mourning uh, their lost loved ones. 13 bodies have already been found from that deadly landslide, uh, but the officials do say that they expect some 10 others to be uh, underneath all of that debris. And that is just one of the landslides, the deadliest that has hit that area of India over the last few days. Uh, this morning, there was another smaller landslide in that same area that saw another two people uh, killed. And the rash of landslides really comes after torrential rain that has been pounding the area for about three days, 157% surge in rainfall over the last three days. And, and that obviously combined with melting glaciers from the Himalayas. There's been flash flooding across the area. It's been a real uh, calamitous situation for the emergency workers that are trying to get to pe people to safety. Some 600 people have been rescued and airlifted from their homes. They've had to flee um, from certain areas, and there are about 100 who are still waiting to be airlifted by army helicopter to get to one of those relief camps that have been set up by emergency officials. So uh, the threat is really high still in that area, even as rescue workers are, are trying to get to, to people who have already perished in the deadly weather. Uh, so the chief minister does say that it is uh, the worst damage that the state has seen ever. Uh, and he says that it is because of climate change that has exacerbated the normal conditions that hit during the monsoons in this part of India. There is more heavy rain in the forecast, at least for the next five days. So the entire area is really just bracing for more to come. And just some breaking weather news for you. We are hearing from the government of the Northwest Territories that they are looking to evacuate the entire capital city of Yellowknife because of the threat of wildfires. The evacuation will take pay place in a phased approach. There is no immediate threat to the city, but the entire city of Yellowknife will need to be evacuated as a result of wildfires. All right, Darius Mandavi, you have been watching wildfire situation here and beyond. Uh, what are things looking like right now for us here in B.C.? Well, it looks like the wildfire situation does seem to be getting worse as a result of the heat that we're seeing and the high pressure system has been sitting over the province. Now, we talked about what that means for air quality. It also means that our temperatures will shoot up a little bit again tomorrow. So today was a couple degrees cooler than we'll see, that we saw yesterday and what we'll see tomorrow. Uh, Vancouver and Victoria, the uh, weather, the heat warnings for those areas just came down uh, of, just a few minutes ago. It looks like Vancouver will still be quite hot tomorrow. You can see here at 24, but really what matters is the humid X. We're gonna have a quite a humid day tomorrow here in Vancouver. And so that's what we'll be looking out for. Temperatures do go up a bit tomorrow before coming back down, sorry, yes, before coming back down uh, on Friday, really as that cold front moves in, meaning that fire danger is going to keep rising tomorrow. Well, you might think it'll come down on Friday as the, the cold front moves through, but unfortunately, it's not going to be bringing too much rain with it. Maybe a few showers for parts of the southern interior, but mainly what it's going to be bringing is lots of wind. We're going to have really high winds moving, gusting through uh, the southern interior as high as uh, almost 60 kilometers per hour in the Kootenays really high, up to 50 in the southern interior, uh, and with the risk of dry lightning as well. So definitely a dangerous situation. That's why the fire danger will not be necessarily improving, even as temperatures do come down. For tomorrow, we still have all that heat coming, plenty of clear skies and sun, uh, but for Vancouver, still just sunny skies, even as temperatures do come down into this weekend. All right, thank you so much for that, Darius. Thank you. The family that inspired the movie The Blind Side is speaking out after retired NFL star Michael Ower accused them of tricking him. Ashley Burke explains. It was a feel-good Hollywood drama that won Sandra Bullock Oscar gold. To the family that allowed me to play them, the Tui family, I know they're in here and you'll probably hear her in a minute. 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity. But now accusations, it was all based on a lie. Are you going to protect the family, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Blindside tells the story of Michael Orr, a homeless black teenager adopted by a wealthy white family. Do you have any place to stay tonight? The Tuies help him become a first round NFL draft pick. You see number 74? Well, that's my son. But Orr says he found it in February. He was never adopted. The blind side, it, it, it's, it's totally different. You know, the blind side, uh, it, it, it was, told, like I said, it was told by other people. Well, promoting his new book, Orr filed a petition in a Tennessee court alleging he was tricked by the Tuies into signing a conservatorship. Conservatorships take away an adult's right to make their own decisions. Orr's petition alleges that at no point did the Tuies inform Michael that they would have ultimate control of all his contracts. In these conservatorship abuse cases, there's a position of trust where one adult gives over this power to the other adult, believing that they have their best interests at heart or not even understanding what they're signing. Orr wants a judge to release him from it and pay him what he calls his fair share of the movie's $300 million in profits. But the Tuies call the allegations ridiculous and say it's all part of a shakedown. If he says he learned that in February, I find that hard to believe. There were things back in 2020, 2021 that they were like, you know, if you guys give me this much, then I won't go public with things. And In a statement their lawyer wrote, the Tuies have given Mr. Orr an equal cut of every penny received from the blind side, have always been upfront about a conservatorship from which not one penny was received and was established to assist with Mr. Orr's needs and will never oppose terminating it. Well, I would like to thank what this film was about for me. Was As the legal battle plays out, people on social media are now calling on Sandra Bullock to hand her Oscar back. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Washington. Going to Sandpoint Beach is like navigating a minefield, a minefield of goose feces. Uh, it's disgusting. We've been here the last couple times over the last couple weeks and it's in the sand on the grass. I'm seeing people step in it, uh, in their feet. It's uh, completely unsanitary and it's just, yeah, it's not very good. Parents are concerned about the safety of their children. I think that they should at least come out here and try to clean it up a little bit for the kids to be able to play down here. <laughs> It's, I wish they could put some, them off in some other spot so that, you know, these kids don't have to play in the boot. No, put it down. Ew, Are she you just disgusted by this? Poop. Yeah, because my daughter just grabbed dog, duck poop. Ew. Your daughter just grabbed on some poop? Yeah. This gaggle of geese is doing more than its fair share of littering the beach with poop. We showed pictures of excrement taken last Friday to the executive director of parks and facilities for comment. He says they are trying to keep the beach groomed with a machine. So that machine runs three times a week, and in addition to that, staff go out and you know pick up larger items that the machine wouldn't be able to handle. Can you move the geese? Uh, you know, looking, I mean, that's something that is possible to look at the relocation. That's a different step that requires some different permitting to both either do a roundup and have geese, you know, completely removed from an area and then brought to, say, like a bird sanctuary like Jack Miners. There's also other ways of, of, of managing the goose population at an earlier stage with either egg addling or certain, some of those other type of things or, you, or just egg removal. But Chaco says they aren't doing that at this time. He says preventing the geese to hang out at the beach is a bit difficult because they also want it to be inviting for swimmers. The health unit samples water at the local beaches every Monday. Today, their website said the beach was safe to swim at based on last week's sample. But the health unit sent us a statement that reads in part, animal waste is a naturally occurring source of bacteria which can impact E. coli levels in beach water. This is what the beach looks like today. When sent pictures of today's conditions, Chaco tells CBC that the beach grooming machine will be out tomorrow morning to clean the beach. Meanwhile, both the city and the health unit warn you not to feed the birds here. The city says if you have more concerns about the beach, you can call 311. Dale Molnar, CBC News, Windsor.
Land Back is a CBC original podcast where we uncover land theft in Canada and look at how Indigenous people are taking it all back. Land Back is out now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. The Punjabi Market Live Festival returns on August 27th, and CBC Vancouver is proud to be the exclusive media partner. Enjoy live entertainment, great food, and family activities. Event info at monsoonartsfest.ca. And on September 16th, join CBC Vancouver at the second annual Come Toward the Fire, a free outdoor festival celebrating Indigenous community, culture, and creativity. Welcome back. More than 1,200 athletes are competing in the Youth Indoor Lacrosse Championships in Regina this week. Some of the best young indoor lacrosse players in the country are there. And as Adam Hunter reports, the competition includes, for the very first time, a division for young girls. One, who are we, Sass? Saskatchewan's under-13 girls lacrosse team celebrated a 4-2 win over Nova Scotia in their opening game this week, the first ever game for girls ages 11 and 12 at the national championship. I think it's pretty awesome um, making history and um, I think that we got to make our province proud. This is the first year there's a girls under 13 division in the national minor box lacrosse tournament. Across Canada approved a motion by SAS lacrosse to include the age division. The national organization says having female players compete starting at age 11 is a chance to promote diversity and inclusivity in the sport. The coach of Saskatchewan's under 13 team says she was surprised by how many young girls tried out. We thought when we started this, we were going to have to be fighting for girls to come. We had so many, we had to end up making cuts. There are 14 divisions of male and female players at the championship. Athletes from 11 to 21 have traveled from across the country for the event. It's about competition and fun. Just the feeling that, you know, we're all, every, all Saskatchewan and our family and friends are watching us and um, supporting us, and that's just a great feeling, just stepping out on that floor. Organizers say the popularity of lacrosse is growing in both Saskatchewan and across the country. They say the evidence is in the number of girls competing this week. In all, 1,200 lacrosse players, both male and female, from coast to coast are aiming to lift hardware at the end of the week. And Regina will do it again as the city is hosting the tournament again next summer. Adam Hunter, CBC News, Regina. More on that breaking news update. On the wildfire situation in the Northwest Territories, officials are now saying that the fire near the capital city of Yellowknife is a real threat. And they are telling residents they need to leave. The evacuation will be phased, with some being told to get out as soon as tonight. And by Friday at noon, they hope to have the whole city emptied. Flights will help with evacuations, but they say by taking a phased approach, they can safely empty the city of nearly 20,000 people. And they stress the city is not in immediate danger, but there is concern it could move to the outskirts of the city by this weekend. We will have more details tonight at 10 p.m. on The National. And, of course, you can always find the latest updates on our website at cbc.ca slash news. And that's it for us here on CBC News Vancouver at 6 p.m. I want to remind you, if you're not already watching us on CBC Gem, that's our free app. You might want to check it out. And, of course, we will be following that situation in the Northwest Territories very closely. We hear that our colleagues at that bureau are actually being evacuated right now. So more on our website to come. Thanks for joining us.